Welcome back. This is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Fumuliner, and today we're taking a look back at some of the civil rights issues at the university and the town at large and talking about the lessons that can be learned from them. Joining me in studio, Michael Middleton is MU's deputy chancellor. He was also at the first African-American student to enroll and graduate from MU's law school, though we had a short uh, correction on that earlier. <laughs> uh, Bill... Uh, we're also joined by Bill Horner. He's a professor of political science at MU and the co-author of a book on Lloyd Gaines, who was an early civil rights pioneer and challenged the law school's ban on African-American students. And Mary Ratliff is joining us by phone. She's the president of the state chapter of the NAACP and has lived in Columbia since 1959. And for you and our audience, do you think Columbia is an inclusive community? What could be done to make it more inclusive? Share your thoughts. Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet us at Intersect KBIA, or you could join our online chat. And, uh, Michael, maybe that's a good question to ask you. I guess, did you see, um, you know, coming to the University of Missouri, did you see a difference between your reception in the community in Columbia or on campus? Or uh, what, what were some of the – or was it all kind of the same, I guess? It, it was all kind of the same. I mean, yeah. you know, Columbia was uh, a, a pretty much a small town at that time. Uh, and, uh, you know, there was still segregation downtown. There, there were – I don't recall ever really trying to to do anything in Columbia because the word I got was that there was so much segregation there. You know, you kind of avoid trying to go into a restaurant if you know they're going to throw you out. Uh, uh, Mary might be better at ex explaining what Columbia was like yeah. in those days than I. I spent most of my time on campus. I didn't have a car, and I didn't really want to venture out into Columbia because of its reputation. Yeah, and so Mary, yeah, you moved to Columbia, I guess, almost a decade earlier than... Uh, uh, I moved to Columbia actually in 59. 15, 1959? Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, what, what was your experience? Um, I think, if I'm, not, if I'm not mistaken, you came, you had lived in Mississippi previously as well. Yes, yes, I did. Um, you know, as Mike had said, you know, I, I, I might joke for Columbia was that I moved to Big Little Dixie, okay, <laughs> when I moved to Columbia, because um, it, there was not a lot of change. And one of the things that, that um, I heard uh, Mike talk about, one of the things that our, our parents and our teachers did for, uh, for us, uh, when you start, when you start talking about the inferiority uh, complexes uh, for many of us, they, they uh, taught us how people felt about us, but also instilled in us that, that, our worth in us, that the discriminatory practice did not belittle us in any way. It, it, how people felt about us did not change who we were, and that, uh, that's, what, that's what my professors brought to me. Uh, but in Columbia, there was, uh, it, it was segregation, there was housing segregation um, in Columbia, um, that, and, and, the, and the attitudes uh, were uh, still, you know, it was like a, a little, little Dixie kind of attitude when you went to the, I spent a lot of time uh, at the city council meetings uh, with um, some, some of the, with the, with the line of A. L. Burks and George Brooks and Jim Nunley and those people working to change, uh, going to the city council and uh, really just uh, almost being, uh, you know, that we just had to be civil, civil disobedient uh, to the, the council because they didn't, they didn't want to hear us when we were talking about issues that, that affected the African-American community, whether we were talking about Blind Moon Center or whether we were talking about uh, uh, fair housing. And uh, during that period of time, we had, uh, I heard uh, Mike talk about uh, um, ho um, Holiday, uh, Harold Holiday. Carol Holiday was here in, in Columbia in law school uh, during that period of time and worked very closely with the community. Um, he and, and another student, uh, uh, James Rollin, who was over there in law school at the time, and, and Mike, you probably remember, I know oh, you yeah. heard the story of Jim Rollins, uh, was over uh, at, the, at that time, and they worked, uh, worked diligently with us here in Columbia to try to, to change the racial climate here uh, uh, in Columbia and was, was received and, and uh, very, very poorly. Uh, so there were, uh, yeah, there, there was just blatant racism in Columbia housing. Housing, I've told this story many times, but when we, uh, we, we saved money to try to buy a house down on Sexton Road, those little white houses that are down there now, 
and um, the guy built three of them, and, and uh, when we'd save, save the money, worked very hard and uh, tried to buy one of the houses, he said, so, you know, sorry, um, I can't sell those other two if I sell the ones to you, you know. Mm-hmm. So um, there was, uh, you know, just wide, widespread. Uh, uh, sure. And one of the things that it was like in Columbia, because they didn't have, I think, the race rats and those sorts of things, it seems that the Columbia uh, uh, majority community felt that uh, there that everybody was just satisfied here. Hmm. That Columbia was just a place that that African American folks were satisfied with because, um, and there was a lot of complacency here, and there was a lot of you know the truth of the matter is there was there was a lot of reluctance in the community. Uh, and sometimes some ill feelings in the community for folks, for, for local folks, when, when some of us that were not willing to accept Columbia uh, because of, of the attitude that it had, some of them felt that, that we were totally, you know, some of the African Americans felt that we were just totally too, for, for, you know, aggressive in our efforts to desegregate uh, Columbia. And sometimes that, that, uh, that divided the community. Especially, you know, when um, um, Rollins and and Doc Holliday they came over and worked very closely with us, and and then they sometimes they were saying, you know, you'll call a problem here, and then you're going to be gone, and we're going to still have the problem. And and I can understand that, but uh, the racism was was for real here mm-hmm. in in Columbia. It was it was live, and it was it was difficult to tear down some of those barriers. Sure. In fact, the, the housing barriers. It was. Very difficult. And when, and when did things start to change? I mean, or or have they changed enough? I don't know. When did things, you know, you, you mentioned the battles you had to fight at city council, things like that. Okay. The things changed, but, you know, um, I don't know if he wants me to say this, but one of the, one of the, I call his name, but one of the uh, pathologists, well thought of pathologists here came um, came to Columbia. And I'm, I'm terrible with dates, so, you know, I don't remember the dates exactly. It must have been, um, it, it was late. Um it must have been 72-ish, three-ish or something like that. Uh, one of the professors came here, came to work at the VA, and uh, was was de- de- basically denied housing right off Providence Road down there between Stadium and I forget that neighborhood, what that neighborhood's called, on, on Providence Road and Stadium, the corner of Providence Road and Stadium, that those houses off there to the, the north. Um, he came. He was a pathologist and 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 wanted to uh, wanted to rent a house there. And his technician was renting the house in that area and built a new house. And then uh, informed her her uh, tenant that she was going to move. But she had talked to this this uh, pathologist who had been to her house and and they wanted to rent it since she was going to move out of it. And and so she said she hadn't told her landlord, so she was going to tell her landlord and that she had, you know, some very qualified folks to rent it to. And Mm -hmm. then when she went to them, they said, fine, that's great. She just said, my pathologist, my boss, you know, Mm -hmm. and they said, fine. You know, so go ahead. And she said, and and, they, and when he was looking at it, he was saying that there was some problems with the with the uh, fireplace and the chimney and all. And and she said, yeah. And he said, well, that would need to be fixed before you know before if he was to, to decide to rent it. And she said, no problem. This is all by phone. No problem. So when can you look at it? So he said, my wife and I will be able to look at it Sunday. And when they went over, the person met them at the door. The the the, the people that they were going to rent it from met them at the door, and said to them, they they told them who they were, and they said, "Sorry, uh, someone was just here before you to rent it." Hmm. Yeah, and this okay. is in the seventies. Yeah, and, the 70s. and and they had you know, someone who was just here before you, and and he said. I know that can't be true because my employee lives here, and my my employee lives here, and my employee told me they told nobody that they were leaving when they were leaving because they were going to give me that first opportunity, and uh, they said they 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 were sorry. 
couldn't read it to them. Mm. They contacted, he contacted me from the NAACP. I called them uh, to, to uh, talk, to tell them that they had filed a complaint, the housing complaint with me. And the, 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 the tenant said at that time when I started questioning, she said, she said, you live in Columbia? And I said, yes. It was a female. You live in Columbia? And I said, yes. And she said, that's why I remember it was after 72. And she said, and who do you work for? And my reply to her was, I work for the federal government. Do you have any pool there? <laughs> you know. And uh, she hung up. And I, she hung up. And so later on, she called me back and she said, you could call my lawyer. You know, mm-hmm. and so I'm talking to the the person. I'm talking to the pathologist, and he's getting, uh, you know, very very upset about whether or not he's going he's going to want to take this place. And I'm saying, now you got to do it now. You know, you mm-hmm. you got to we we started this. Right. Mm-hmm. So anyway, well, yeah. well, they they yeah. call me back, and I was able to um, the call, she called me back, and she said um, the lawyer called me back and said we're going to rent him the house, but we're not going to do any repairs. <laughs> <laughs> and, yeah. and I said, unacceptable, okay? That's unacceptable. Sure. Yeah. Sure. Well, so and, we, we would not accept that, okay? Right. And so, well, and, and Michael, I wonder too, I mean, you actually left Columbia for a while, if I'm not mistaken. Yes. And then came back in the 80s. So, yes. um, yeah, w- in the time period we're talking about there with Mary's in the 70s, but did you see much change when you returned in the 80s and, and I guess since then? Yeah, I, I saw change, but I, I saw the same change that, that I saw across the country. I mean, what what I was doing during that 15-year uh, period when I was gone, I was in Washington, D.C. with the Department of Justice uh, doing civil rights law, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and I litigated cases all over the country. I mean, the, what what Mary is describing and what I've described to you uh, of my experience in the 60s was happening all over the country, right. and right. the entire country has moved beyond where we were then. Yes. Uh, I saw the change when I returned in the 80s from, mm-hmm. from what Columbia was like in, in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And I've seen change in Columbia and at the university since I came back in 85 to right. uh, 2014. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I think what I'm saying is that this, this process of moving us forward Right. I mean, I remember stories from my great-grandfather who was one of the first African-American lawyers in the state of Mississippi. Uh, He was admitted to the bar in 1895. And there are stories in my family passed down from my grandfather and my and my mother Mm -hmm. that that show that progress. I mean that my parents lived in the in the 1920s uh, in in Mississippi and up to St. Louis to Chicago. I mean Mm -hmm. those of us in the African-American community Understand that history, mm. and 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 see the change that has occurred over the last fifty, sixty, seventy years, mm-hmm. uh, and and we appreciate the progress. Mm-hmm. Don't get me wrong, mm-hmm. but we also know how much further there is that we need to go. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you look at the incarceration rates of African American mm-hmm. young people, mm-hmm. you look at the education rates of African Americans in this country. You look at the socioeconomic status of, of, of African American families in this country, mm. then you see that while we have made significant gains from the days of outright um, uh, marginalization and, and, and rejection, we've made significant progress. We are still not where we need to be as a country or as a community right here in Columbia or as a university. And, Absolutely. Uh, and Absolutely. that's just a. That, that's not a harsh criticism. Mm-hmm. That's a recognition of, of the way societies and cultures evolve. Mm-hmm. And we're not, we're, we, and, and certainly we, we are not trying to say that, uh, that great progress has not been made. Yeah. Because we've seen great you know, progress. We've seen great progress in Colombia. What we are saying is that we have not reached that pinnacle where we can say that you know, everything is, 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 is equal Every, you know, everything, that there's no disparity, I guess I want to say. Sure. That there's no disparity. And so, you know, we just have to keep, uh, we, have, we just have to keep working at it 
until we get to that point, and we we know that we're not we're nowhere near there yet. Right. And take a moment to remind our audience this is Intersection, a program of KBIA and the Reynolds Journalism Institute. I'm Ryan Femiolner, and today we're taking a look back at some of the civil rights issues at the university and town at large and talking about the lessons that can be learned from them. Joining me in studio, Michael Middleton is MU's deputy chancellor. Uh, Bill Horner is a professor of political science at MU and the co-author of a book on Lloyd Gaines. And Mary Ratliff is the president of the state chapter of the NAACP and has lived in Columbia since 1959. For you and our audience, do you think Columbia is truly integrated? Share your thoughts. Give us a call at 573-882-8925 or email intersection at kbia.org. You could also tweet at intersect kbia. So yeah, to that same point, um, you mentioned some of the big societal institutional factors, Michael, that are, are, are kind of blocking um, some real progress. But w- what can communities do? What can be, what can happen at Columbia? What can happen at MU um, to move things, to continue to move things forward? Uh, that's that's if if I had the answer to that, yeah. I'd be a gazillionaire. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, but I think what what we can do is rely on uh, on uh, young people. Uh, becoming exposed to people of different cultures, di- with different backgrounds, in a climate like the university, where 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 young people can come to the realization that uh, skin color, sexual orientation, gender, uh, and all of these things that that in the past we've used to divide ourselves and and create pecking orders for ourselves. All of those things are irrelevant to an individual's ability to contribute to society and advancing society. And the, right, and the more I, young people that we get to to uh-huh. recognize that, uh-huh. the and quicker can, we'll make progress. And hop in there, uh, we have to start with our young people. We we, we have to start providing uh, the opportunities prior to them getting to the university. No question. Uh, um, so that, uh, and we have to look at the, the barriers that keep them from getting to the university. And, uh, of course, I, I keep talking about uh, and referring everybody to the, the Youth Promise Act uh, that Bobby Scott introduced um, that's online that everybody can go on and look at. That That is a good roadmap, a good first step to us working toward trying to uh, get our young, get uh, programs, et cetera, where our young people can be ready for the university so they will be ready to enter uh, into uh, the, the workplace, into mm-hmm. society, uh, trained uh, and, and ready to hit the ground running. And so there are, that's where we have got to spend so much of our, our, our time trying to make those kinds of things happen in our community that and, and and we need to just really look at our community to see what kind of resources that that we have do we want to take our resources and uh, send them off to Jefferson City someplace to pre- pay for prisoners or do we want so they can come out and 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 rob us again and and kill us again or do whatever it is or do we want to prepare young people on the front end to be productive uh, citizens in our society, and that—that's, you know, that's our challenge. Bill, I saw you want to jump in yeah. there. Well, I, I was just—I was—I was thinking when when Mary was talking about 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 you know violence against African Americans, I, I was I would be curious to know what both what uh, the Deputy Chancellor and and Mary think about um, you know what appears to be on the Supreme Court at the moment, moving moving closer and edging closer and closer with a couple of cases now toward um, reversing what was just, you know, a decade ago settled policy about with regard to um, affirmative action in higher education and, and where you think, you know, what the appropriate line is in that policy, because that's something we've, we talk a lot about in my American government class. <laughs> um, and, and, and I, you know, the, the court seems to be edging, move, you know, moving toward reversing uh, itself in the, uh, in the, Grutter versus Bollinger decision. Well, the, yeah, and the, yeah, the court's been dancing around that issue for years. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. um, I don't know if they're moving any closer to to uh, reversing uh, policies of of affirmative action in higher ed. I think they're they're fine tuning and refining uh, their definitions and their analysis, but they haven't backed away from the notion that uh, it's appropriate. Uh, to use race as a consideration among many in the admissions process uh, so long as that use is narrowly tailored to achieve 
a recognized uh, compelling governmental interest in 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 uh, the in in a structure that at a university that that uh, benefits from uh, diversity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. diversity is a compelling governmental interest. The Supreme Court has said that and not backed off. The latest decision they made in the in the Fisher case in Texas right. was essentially. Um, People think of it as a reversal of a, of a decision affirming the use of race there. What it in fact was was a remand of right. that case to a lower court for them to make the judgment whether that narrow tailoring standard had been met. And the problem was that the district court accepted the word of the university uh, rather than examining the facts itself to, to, to make that determination. So it was a, it was a procedural um, remand that didn't really change the law. Well, but but as, you, as you say, I mean, there, there is a, a, a tendency towards mm -hmm. restricting the use of, of race yeah. in right. these decisions. And I don't know where the court's going to go. You know, politics have, have changed and it, it, Yeah, it depends on who's sitting on the court at the, the, yeah. the time that the, the case you know, comes up, and that's why it is, you know, it is so important who sits on the Supreme Court. Um, uh, we know that, that we feel that we're in kind of on, on uh, I don't feel quite as confident as Mike does <laughs> that, mm -hmm. that, um, that, 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 uh, the, that's, that affirmative action portion is not being undermined. Um, but we are struggling, uh, you know, the NACP and our legal team is working very, very hard uh, to uh, make sure that we keep that in that portion of it intact. Sure. So we'll see how that all uh, weighs out. But we, I know we're, we're spending a lot of, spending a lot of time and effort uh, in, in that arena right now. Sure. And Mary, as we get closer to the end of the show here, um, I haven't really, I've asked you what you thought about Columbia throughout time, but what, what do you think about Columbia today in regards to race relations? I think that um, I think that Columbia has come come uh, an awful long way, as I said, since '59 in in the area of race relations. I think it still has. I think the culture of Columbia is a still. Um, there's a lot of. There's still a lot of segregation going on. You walk down uh, the stores in Broadway, you go into the banks, the insurance companies, and all of those different areas, and you don't see, when you don't see people that look at all like you, then you know that you that, that Columbia have not moved to the point uh, where um, it, 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 it ought to be. And so, you know, that's our challenge to keep, uh, keep bringing it. However, I think that that we that, that you know that we the lead, as long as you can keep the the dialogue open where you can where you can communicate and talk and that's what we can do nowadays that we that that were not available to us in the past when we went to the council in the past is that nobody was listening you know you had nobody to listen to you and uh now we 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 see some changes made because of the fact that we are at the table and we are making suggestions, et cetera, such as with commissions and, and task forces and those sorts of things. So I think there is that attempt to, uh, uh, to, to bring, uh, to tear down some of those, those walls and barriers that, that have so long uh, divided us. Um, however, in saying that, I still say, that Columbia needs to think more about when it talks about diversity and when I look at the diverse, diversity breakfast, et cetera, we still, and we're still in a state of assimilation, assimilation where, you know, we, we, we go to activities that are sponsored by, you know, the, the city and the community and all. When we come back to our communities for like the Martin Luther King uh, celebration and all, you know, we fill up the executive center. But the, on Monday we have the activity and we have 150 or 200 people show up, you know, and we have 25 or 30 white individuals show up for for that um, that occasion as if that's in the black community. So we don't need to 
you know, we don't need to go there. And if we're going to have, we still, if we're going to have an affair that that encompasses the, the, the whole community, too many times we have areas in, in Colombia that will house a number of people for a number of meetings, but many of the times we put them into, uh, we say we have to put them into the majority community and then invite the minority community in uh, instead of everybody supporting everything that goes on uh, citywide in the community. Do you hear what I'm saying? Uh, Yeah. Is that we are talking Mm -hmm. about, I'm talking about, you know, uh, integration versus assimilation. Right. And, and Michael, I wonder your thoughts on that too, and I guess specifically on campus, having knowing your role here at MU. Well, you know, there, there, there's, there was a book written or an article written about uh, high schools. Why do all the black kids uh, eat in the cafeteria together or something? And and you know that that flashed in my mind as Mary was talking. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much opportunity there is for the the majority community to uh, participate with uh, in activities in the in the African American community. I know a few folks do. I don't know how comfortable people feel uh, integrating towards the black community as versus black community integrating towards the white community. Uh, I think that's a very complex issue, and I think Mary raises a good point that people really need to think about that and uh, see how they can uh, they can go both ways in this in this area of of integrating. Uh, I hadn't really thought about it that much because I kind of go both both ways by virtue of of what I do in this community. Um, but that's a very good issue and a and a very uh, uh, an area where there needs to be some some serious thought yeah. amongst all of us. Mm-hmm. We've got Absolutely. Just about 30 seconds left. Oh. Tell, maybe tell us a little bit about what's the event on Thursday, if you don't mind. Is sure. It, yeah. the, well, event, the event on Thursday is uh, several several folks are participating. We're going to, my co-author, James Endersby, and I are going to be talking about our book, but uh, Deputy Chancellor Middleton is going to be there, uh, the assistant mm-hmm. principal at... Um, the new battle high school is going to be there talking about uh i think about the battles and about her, her experience as a, as a, a assistant principal at the high school and um uh um yeah um and there's a couple other panelists that I just oh my goodness oh <laughs> excuse me uh, Dr. King Wilma King is going to be there oh, she's yeah. the chair of the Black Studies Department here on campus and I am blanking on the name of the woman she runs uh, Granny's house here in town and she's going to be there as well uh, Pam uh, Pam Ingram yeah, there you go. pardon me and that'll be at yes. 6 o'clock at Missouri Theater on Thursday well yeah. that's all the time we have for today's intersection thanks to our guests Michael Middleton William Horner and Mary Ratliff We'd like to remind those of you enjoying this is a rebroadcast that Intersection takes place live for a full hour from 2 to 3 every Monday afternoon. You can watch live streaming video of our broadcast each Monday afternoon on KBIA.org. Alongside that video, you can submit your questions and comments and take part in an online discussion with others in the audience. You'll also find an archive of all of our past programs, including the full hour of today's conversation. Intersections are broadcast from the Reynolds Journalism Institute and is a project of RJI and KBIA. Intersections produced by Casey Morrell, Raymond Tungakar, Janet Saidi, and Ruben Stern. Travis McMillan's our technical director with production assistance from Rachel Gangware. Pat Akers is our audio producer. Executive directors are Mike Dunn and Mike McKean. And I'm Ryan Famuel. Thanks for joining us today and have a great week.